welcome to this week's episode of the Amazon Files brought to you by Mommy Income. I am Kristen Ostrander. And I am Amy Fearman. Welcome this week. We're glad you are here joining us. We are going to be talking about the do's and don'ts of selling on Amazon. Kristen and I have been at this for um, a few years and we've learned a lot of things and we want you to learn from our mm, mistakes. <laughs> And also the things you do want to do and don't want to do. And um, a few years, give us a little more credit. I've been at this for almost a decade and Amy's right behind me at five years. So we have just more than a few years of experience with this. We really want to help you. All right. Now I want to make sure we are working on planning our Confident Wholesale Bundlers workshops for 2019 and we want your input. That's right. We're asking for your help to pick where we are going to be hosting our Confident Wholesale Bundlers workshops next year. If you haven't come to one in 2018 because the locations and the dates didn't work for you. We love your input. We actually have a post in our Facebook group right now asking you for your input on what cities and specific trade shows you would like us to come teach a workshop at. So if you head over to our Facebook group and look in the announcement section, you'll see that post. Now, if you are not a member of our Facebook group yet, we'd love you to join. You can head over to mommyincome.com slash join us with the code word top five, answer a couple questions and we'll let you in the group. You can answer that question, introduce yourself and be on your way on your Amazon journey. Yeah, and also one more announcement we don't want you to miss is that just last week we taught our live Q4 Jumpstart class. It was off the hook. We were so excited. We went over two hours answering your questions, giving you content. We have our holiday action calendar in there. We have a, we don't call it a BOLO list. We call it a product idea list where we give you a little bit of snapshots and a few ASINs to kind of look out for. But it's not about that. It's all about learning what to sell, when to send in your inventory, how to price it um, and according to um, supply and demand, different things like that. If this is your first Q4, you do not want to miss the Q4 Jumpstart class. It is now available, instant access in our classes. So go to mommyincome.com slash Q4 so that you can still get that. It's available until the end of the month and then it's gone until next year. So if you want to get a jumpstart on Q4, um, we're already been jumpstarting on Q4. You guys were selling Halloween stuff already and it is right now, August the 6th, and we're already selling Halloween stuff. Why? Because we purchased it ahead of time. We sent it in. Now, I don't suggest you send all of your Halloween in right now, this second, but it's getting there. People are starting to shop. And so um, it, that's just the beginning of Q4. There's so many things that um, you can be getting ready for right now before it's too late, before all your pet competitors start jumping in. So get your jump start on Q4, mommyincome.com slash Q4 to get the class. Yep. And that is we want you to be ahead of the competition. So make sure you check that out. Now, everyone is- Deb just said, I saw somebody buying Halloween costumes today at Costco. Yes, people, Halloween is already out there. So if you're doing retail arbitrage, go to Costco, go to Joanne Fabrics, go to Michael's. These places already have out their Halloween and fall decor. They have so much stuff already. Get the Q4 class, learn what to sell and get it on the shelves. At home already has Christmas out, says Michelle. Good grief, that's a few months ahead of schedule. That's insane. But let's get on to topic for tonight. Now let's go back. Everyone is super duper excited when they get started on Amazon. And then guess what happens? The new wears off and the honeymoon period is over. And then what happens? Well, then people are like, okay, now I'm afraid to take the plunge. I'm afraid to kind of start doing this or you've started a little bit and you still don't know what to do. So we're going to talk about some of the common issues and pitfalls that people have when they're first starting off on Amazon. And we are going to take you what into what you should do on Amazon. And then we'll make sure that we get to what you stay away from coming up at the end of the show. Now, the first thing, the one, number one, first thing you should always do when you're starting off as an Amazon seller you should always read the terms of service. Yes, I know that long document that has a lot of mumbo jumbo in it. You need to understand what it says because you are selling on Amazon's platform. Um, we have both links to the policies and agreements and the seller agreement that you sign, air quotes there, um, when you sign up to be a seller on Amazon. You wanna know what that says so you make sure that you're not making missteps as you get started selling on Amazon. Because the last thing you wanna do is start selling and get the door shut down on you because you made a mistake because you didn't read the terms of service or the guidelines that they give you. Now, before you start freaking out and thinking, oh my gosh, this is so impossible and this is a lot of documents to read and you know, I might as well not even start because of this and this and this, 
Um, believe it or not, no matter what business that you start, there's always going to be policies and procedures and rules and things that you have to follow. This is not new for business. You are starting a legitimate business. You can make bank doing this. We support our family 100% by this income. So it is legit. It is above board, but follow the policies and learn the seller agreement. Now, one thing that people get scared of is that uh, I believe that it was used to be the, the seller agreement number 21 or whatever. I can't remember the exact number, but it basically said, we can, we can cease to do business with you at any moment for any reason. That's my um, legalese uh, air quote kind of um, shortness of that one. Basically in their legalese, they say, for whatever reason, however, whenever, we can terminate this agreement at any time for any purpose, any reason. So, but Amazon doesn't go around just shooting people, okay? The Amazon only will, flag you if you're doing something wrong. They don't go run around chasing around people to kick off Amazon. So if you hear people in other Facebook groups or other places whining about the fact that Amazon suspended them for no reason, um, that's a bunch of bull. And I'm just always a reason. There's always a reason and something that they didn't know about, but it's kind of like the speed limit. Like you're expected to know the speed limits. And if you break the speed limit and get pulled over, you tell the cop, well, I didn't see the sign. I don't know how fast I'm supposed to be going here. He goes, not my problem, and he writes your ticket because you are supposed to be aware of the rules, the policies, the speed limits in Amazon. And whether or not you decide to familiarize yourself with those or not, you're still accountable to them. So um, just become familiar. If you get nervous or scared, just reach out and ask. Ask um, Seller Central themselves or ask in a Facebook group or something and say, I don't understand this. Can you guys clarify if anybody knows more about this than me? And sometimes it's clear as mud because it's Amazon. And that is true. Now we pulled out a couple things that we find that new sellers and sellers who may have been doing this a while still might get stuck on. Number one is prepping your items correctly. There is tons of information on Amazon. I'll pull the link so you guys can check it out of videos. Now, yes, there are still questions that say, well, they don't talk about this particular item or whatnot. And that's when coming into the Facebook group and asking those questions, because sometimes, as Kristen said, things are clear as mud. But being able to process your inventory correctly so it A, can get checked in quickly and correctly at the warehouse, that it doesn't get damaged or dirty in its transit from your door to the customer's door. It goes through a warehouse and tons and bazillions and gazillions of conveyor belts, guys. It is not like a simple pick, put in the box and do everything gently. That's not how warehouses work, don't we wish. So making sure that you put your effort into processing and prepping your inventory so it can make the journey to its final destination. In our Start FBA Today course, we actually like show some of this and kind of how to, well, and even in wholesale bundles, we show like how to package certain things. And we don't go through the entire um, gamut of how you package every single thing. But when in doubt, protect it. Put a poly bag around it just in case because you just don't know. You don't have to overcompensate. Like if it's a used book, you under, you know, $20, you don't have to put it in a poly bag. But like other things you think, okay, could this possibly not make it to the customer without getting dirty, dinged, or damaged? Just poly bags are like five cents or less a piece. Some of them are two cents if you buy them in bulk enough. So just protect it if you can, and then just move on knowing that you know that you put something else around it. People use shrink wrap, people use extra boxes. You know what, we sell um, some coffee mugs usually around Q4 and we literally double bubble them and box them. Why? Because my money's involved, <laughs> your money's involved. I have to pre-buy that inventory. You better believe it's gonna make it to the customer and a couple of sets worth of bubble wrap and a 25 cent box is worth protecting my $25 coffee mug. So for the love of all things, please protect your inventory. Exactly. Protecting your inventory. Now, this one is another big one that we see some shady activity with people try and get through the loopholes. Make sure you are selling your product in the proper category. If you are not approved to sell in clothing or shoes, do not try and list your shirt in toys because it has a cartoon character on it, guys. It is still apparel. It still belongs in the correct category. Amazon will shut you down for doing things like that. We still see it happening. Know the correct place. Don't give us the, well, so-and-so's doing it, so it must be okay. So-and-so just hasn't been caught yet, and when they do, they're gonna be sad that Amazon suspends them for life, and then like keeps their money for 90 days, and then there's a lawsuit. You don't want to go down that road, you guys, or you don't have to have to pay wonderful companies um, that are out there that will get you unsuspended, but they cost a lot of money and they're well worth it. But then you have to pay two, $3,000, get your account re 
reinstated and that's no fun. So just for the love of all things, please just follow the rules. If you're not ungated, then try your best to get ungated. Go to, go to a trade show, buy a handful of something and, and show Amazon your invoice and they will kindly let you in. So don't try to circumvent the rules. Yeah, and we've had people who tried 12, 13, 14 times and then gotten approved in a category. Persistence pays off to get you there legit. It doesn't pay to circumvent the rules and get yourself suspended. We want to protect you from that. So do what you're supposed to do and follow the rules. And let me tell you, this, I don't know if you're going to be able to read this far enough away, but this is true about Amy and I both. She believed she could, so she did. This, my mom got this for me because why? Because that's the nicest way in the world to say she's really stubborn and always gets what she wants. <laughs> Persistent little bugger I am. And so is Amy. Both of us this past month landed, sell, landed vendors that have said no to us repeatedly. And we've just kept saying, but this is how we do things different. Look at my pictures. Look at our listings. Look at our website. Look at the fact that we do things different than other people. Please let us in. And Amy is sitting there on a pile of samples and catalogs from a place that said no to her for six weeks. But she believes she could, so she did. And that's what we're saying to you. If you're gated in a category, jump through the hoops. Do what you have to do. Spend a little bit of money. Spend a little bit of time because I promise you, your competitors won't. They'll either try to break the rules or they'll whine and complain and say, I hate Amazon. They won't let me sell in any category. Boo hoo. Yes, they will, but you have to work for it. I mean, they're not just going to hand it to you. They want to see legit wholesale invoices and I've never been turned down for a legitimate wholesale invoice to say I want to sell in this category here's what I bought from this wholesaler doesn't have to be a ton of money but you have to be persistent and it, there's ways to sell in proper categories but you have to do it the right way that is so true now another one that I this one is close to my heart because I am a very visual person and this one drives me bananas. We buy with our eyes, guys. When you're searching on the web, whether it's Amazon or not, what is the first thing you look at? We've always joked for years about the really bad images on eBay. Um, well, there are bad images on Amazon as well. Please, 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 please take the time, effort, and energy to properly photograph and remove the background from your images. Number one, Amazon has started pulling images that have things that shouldn't be on them. We've started to see that in the past week. But also, your buyer wants to see what they're getting. I drives me nuts when I see an image and it's this itty bitty. And guess what? It's so small that you can't even zoom in it to see it. I'm like, I can't know what I'm buying. It could be I'm buying a miniature toaster oven for all I know. So make sure that you can have an image that's clear, well lit, and um, it has zoom quality, which means it needs to be at least a thousand pixels on each side. I always do 1500 to give it more. Um, seller support told me that at one point. Okay. And just for fun, I'm going to show you one of like, this is what not to do. Um, so just take a look at this and now I'm not dissing this bundle necessarily. I'm talking about the image and this is what we're going to talk about why. So if you can see this here, you'll see this Christmas stocking pre-filled vintage toy, which I think is a great idea. But look at what, look at the quality of the pictures here. First of all, like there's shadows and there's lighting issues and they left every single thing in the package. Like how can you really tell what that little race car is because it's still in the package? Like sacrifice one, open it up, show it. Like, you know, like this one, it's opened up and showed. That's great, but that's not the main image. So, and then what is this candy cane? Okay, I have to pick on this for a minute. I can't even help myself. Why is there one candy cane in here as part of this bundle? <laughs> it makes no sense at all, but okay. So look, take the time to like, this is like mediocre. It's like, okay, but like take the time to take stuff out of the package, really showcase it, really show it, sacrifice one so that you can get a good picture. I mean, it's just worth it. Yeah, and if you struggle with photography and taking that, we do actually have an entire section in our wholesale bundle system that talks about how to to do photography. I actually walk you through my step-by-step -step process for shooting in daylight, shooting in front of a window, um, when you don't have a light box, when you don't have the full setup. Guys, I sold on eBay for years. I never had a full setup. I still don't. I don't need one. You just need to know the basics of what it means to do good photography. And it really doesn't take that hard. As long as you have a current smartphone, you have a better camera than a lot of DSLRs. So just know that. Um, and Here's, here's, oh, another, here's one. another one. Oh, I'm fine with this. First of all, this is not a pure white background just because it's on a white poster board or a sheet or something. It's not pure white. 
Number one, it is very hard to get pure white when you're shooting unless you have your white balance set correctly. There are tools out there that allow you to do it. Without a DSLR, it is a challenge and a struggle. And even with a DSLR, it's hard. This is why they have programs like Photoshop and services like pixels.com. I'll put the link in the chat because we highly recommend pixels because they do the removal for you. Yeah, I mean, we, we pay them often for different things. If we're not getting stock photos from our vendors, then we're having them grouped together. And something like this, this is probably dollar store arbitrage, which is totally fine and legit. I actually like the concept of this bundle. It makes a lot of sense for your little Spider-Man, you know, fan or whatever. It's a great bundle. Okay. Take the, take the tag <laughs> off the stocking so you can see that it actually says Spider-Man, please. I'm sorry if this is your bundle. We love you. Let's have a chat. Um, but if it's not, like, look, this is, especially if this is dollar store, take the hang tag off and then like kind of showcase the fact this could be all white background and then it would actually look pretty decent. But don't leave to packages on there. Don't leave price stickers. And for the love of all things, don't leave hang tags on them. Or if it's got cellophane around it, take it off and sacrifice one so you can get a good photo. Don't take eBay like photos. This is not eBay, folks. This is Amazon. And I will say that you want to, if you are selling wholesale and you've taken that step, have the conversation with your rep and ask for images. Because if they have a catalog, if they have an online catalog, they have had professional images shot of those products. And I guarantee you they have a database of all that stuff stored somewhere. Whether you have to ask for particular SKUs or they can give you access to an entire catalog where you can download them yourself, ask the question. It's one that I tend to ask when I'm looking at a wholesaler, because guess what? I had to do one where they didn't have product photography and I had to shoot it all. Guess what? I decided not to continue carrying because there was so much work involved. Every time I wanted to bring a new SKU, I said, no, thank you. I'll use the manufacturers that provide me with their images because it makes my life a lot easier. Another check mark for why I want to do wholesale right there. Yeah, but it's fine. We started out doing bundles, taking our own pictures and they're, you know, good lighting is a big deal. This is not eBay. It has to be right. It has to be according to Amazon's images. And now they're even getting more strict about things. So following the rules is important. Remember, you're a step ahead of anybody else out there who refuses to follow the rules. So just do it right. Do it right the first time. And then you don't have to go back and do it again. So next one is oh, oh. this. This is my favorite one. I love to get on my soapbox about this. So we want you to take your business slow, not too slow. We want to have a pace, not a, I'm too scared to do anything pace, but you have to have a pace and work at your own pace. Making excuses is not making progress. So instead of whining about it's too hard, it's too overwhelming. I don't know what to do next. There are definitely things that you can do. Yes. One of the things that both Kristen and I have done, we started our businesses when we had small people at our ankles and in our arms, and we were able to do things 15 minutes at a time. That's how much time we had. That's how much time Kristen had before Benjamin, her oldest, would climb shelves and knock fish bowls over and all sorts oh of crazy I could literally tell you stories all like we had a barbecue the other day at my aunt's house and we were all taking turns around this big fireplace or around the fire pit telling funny stories and literally every story I had is about my son because he was so he was just curious George and Dennis the Menace kind of all into one but he was the sweetest kid in the world so cute you like could hardly get mad at him but he was so wild and so 15 minutes is literally all I had to do to work. And so we, Amy and I co-wrote 15minutehustle.com. It's the book that we wrote about this. It's a chart. It comes with, where's my chart? Oh, I have to get up my chart. We have a 15 minute hustle chart that basically allows you to break your day into four 15 minute tasks. Now you're like, I have a lot more time in my day than four 15 minutes. That's only an hour, but guess what? You can build your business one hour a day. There's the 15 minute hustle chart. Love it. Love my chart. This is, I laminated it for like $2 and I write with whiteboard marker or even Sharpie wipes off of this really well. There's four slots. Everybody can work on their business one hour a day, 15 minutes at a time. I did it. Amy did it. You guys can do this because it really helps you. If you make out this list and say, today I will do these four things, 15 minutes at a time. Bam. You worked on your business for seven hours that week. You didn't do it seven hours at a time, but you got seven hours done because every day you spend an hour, 15 minutes at a time. We know you can do this no matter where you are in your life. Um, so 15 minute hustle.com to get the book, to get your chart won't be laminated. If you get the ebook, you'll have to um, print it out and laminate it yourself. Um, but it's worth the $2 that you spend doing that because it so works. Work at your own 
pace. This is your business. You're not gonna, you don't have to work like everyone else works. You have different circumstances. Yeah. And, but remember learning is part of being new to business, but, and I will put a big, but I wish I had a big sign that said, but do <laughs> not. Wait, you want a big butt sign? <laughs> She just went there, guys. She just added an extra T to that butt. Anyway, but we do not want you to get stuck in the learning phase. We have seen way too many students of ours who have been in the six-month, 12-month education program on getting ready to sell on Amazon. You do not need to spend days, weeks, months, years preparing for this, guys. The best thing that you can do is read a little bit and send in your first box because that box is going to give you more of an education on how the process actually works than all the reading you can do out there. You have to act on what you're doing. You have to try it. You actually have to try it and practice it to see what works best for you and what doesn't. How do you know that wholesale isn't going to work best for you if you don't actually sign up for an account or go to a trade show or just, you know, sign up for our workshop and figure it out. You have to be able to try something somewhere. And, and learning is wonderful. And Amy and I are actually constantly learning too. We have um, hours of our week that we dedicate to learning new skills. Um, actually was learning some stuff today. I was educating myself on some things that I need to do. And I was like, yay, I'm going to try this new thing. I just learned. And I was like, it worked out great. But sometimes it's a total flop. And I'm like, I gotta try that again. So just do what you gotta do, but you won't know if it's a flop until you actually start it and, and practice it. Yeah. You have to try it to pra and, and practice it because otherwise you're never going to know you're going to be in that limbo and you get to that. Well, what if I had started this how many years earlier, or what if I had started using two inch tape to seal my boxes six months or my, my best one is how much faster could I have processed a shipment if I had actually used a barcode scanner instead of hand typing in ISBN numbers for two years. Oh, Lord. Been there, done that. Don't make my mistake and go buy yourself one of those $25 hand scanners that you can plug in with a USB cord. Trust me, they make your life a lot easier when you're starting out. For our retail arbitrage friends, buying a KDC 100 or 1000 or whatever they're called or a ScanFob. Um, yeah, I can't reach that right now, but I would have to like literally jump off my stool and reach it. But I have a scan fob in here. And when I convinced Amy to buy a scan fob, best thing ever. Why? Because it, it cut her retail arbitrage scanning time in half. Instead of like take your phone and like try to angle it and make try sure. Try and hold the phone and the product and not drop the product on your head and et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. You, I'm sure you've dropped product on your head if you're doing all right. Um, so it just made it easier. I, I, I almost okay yeah I did break something once and um it's like uh yeah it was really embarrassing I'm like I want to scan this thing and I literally dropped it on the floor and broke it and I'm like now what do I do I break it you bought it I don't see the sign <laughs> it was bad I was really embarrassed but it's okay I told the manager about it I was willing to pay for it but they're like no it happened so it was good mm. but I was super immersed by that. How does a scan fob work? Oh, I'm going to educate you quickly on what that is. So a scan fob is a small scanner. It's a Bluetooth scanner that you connect via Bluetooth to your phone. It has a little laser on the end of it. You click the button, it scans the barcode and automatically reads that information into your phone, whether you're on the Amazon seller app or using something like inventory that will Scatify from inventory lab where it brings that information and then all the information about those products will pop up for you. So it, this is what it looks like. I always put Velcro on the back of mine so that the Velcro can go on the back of my phone like this. And then I can scan like this incognito, one hand, one barcode thing, and I press the button and it scans it, no problem. And then I just take it off when I don't need it, Velcro, perfect. Now I will tell you that um, there is a video on our YouTube channel, I'll see if I can get a link for the chat, of Kristen showing the difference between using a scan fob and not using a scan fob when she was doing RA. I think it was probably in Meyer a couple of years ago. And it just shows you the speed. I remember when I went from my phone, I was on a 4S at the time, it was, felt like it took me forever to scan one aisle at a store. I felt like I was gonna be there for a century. And I switched to a scan fob and it was like night and day. It was amazing. Now, they, to me, I would rather spend my time wholesaling at this point because I'm much more comfortable and confident in doing that. Um, I was never a big fan of wandering around stores, but I'm not a shopper. It's because she wandered. That's why. <laughs> she, she struggled to find a plan at first, but once she had a plan, she used to hit the jackpot a lot and be like, oh yeah, once I actually started scanning everything on a shelf, I once, started finding products. <laughs> once I had accountability 
helped a lot in that department because I would, I would call Kristen and say, I didn't find anything. Target's stupid. And she would say, did you scan an entire aisle yet? And I said, no. She said, go back and call me once you scan two aisles. And what happened? Uh, most of the time I would find a cart full of stuff to buy. Yeah. The reality so. is I would just cherry pick an aisle, which means scanning what I quote unquote thought would sell. And that's not how you find product. That's reality. All right. So where are we at? Oh, this smart one. This, this leads us right into smart sourcing because we have seen I, and have participated in not smart sourcing. So we're going to get right into continuing the conversation about retail arbitrage and some of the tips we have for you. Number one, please make sure you have a backup battery or charger for your phone. And not something that's in the car where you have to go and sit in your car for two hours waiting for your phone to charge because that's going to be a waste of time. Get one. Okay, I have a brick. It's probably this big because it's five years old at this point. They make them very small now and they fit in your pocket, fit in your purse. You can attach it via USB cord. And you can still scan while charging your phone. And the, if you're using a scan pod or Bluetooth, it ends up sucking more of your battery than you're used to. So um, just charge the battery, make sure that you're charged up. And when you're plugging in, going from store to store, plug your phone in, plug your battery, backup battery. And I don't know how many times we went out um, retail arbitrage sourcing for an entire day. And by hour six, I'm like, literally my battery's dead. And so is my backup battery because I forgot to charge that too. So yeah, been there, done that, don't want to do that again. Also, sign up for your regular stores, emails, and their, their um, you know, rewards. If like, for example, we used to go to Ollie's all the time. And I know it's regional, so some of your guys are going to be like, what is Ollie's? It's very similar to a Big Lots, but they have like a lot of brand name stuff, a lot of overstock stuff from other stores. They have everything from health and beauty to grocery to toys to lawn and garden to sheets and bedding, which happened to be one of my favorite sections in there, by the way. Um, because they had name brand like sheets and bedding like from you know other stores that were discounted whatever but three times a year they did a 15% off your entire purchase they're very tax exempt friendly and 15% off of Ollie's prices were a steal because their prices were a steal anyway the only thing that stinks about Ollie's is their price stickers that you have to pull off every single product and they're like bright orange almost like this or something and Oh Lord, they were a pain, but they had some great deals that were worth it. And so, but 15% off, I mean, you're getting 15% better than your customers are. Plus they're really tax exempt friendly. So sign up for their email, sign up for their rewards card, get a separate email account for these emails. So they're not flooding your inbox all the time of all this stuff, but um, get a separate Gmail or whatever else is only for your, um, you know, your, your deals you know, and then look for them before you go out. It's like Retail Me Not. I literally do not spend any money until I check Retail Me Not to make sure there's not a coupon or a discount for something. Yeah, yeah Kristen I'm taught me about- Do not make fun of me. <laughs> Kristen taught me about Retail Me Not. She'd be like, what, you're not checking Retail Me Not? This is when we go shopping together. She goes, we have to. I'm like, I'm like, okay, you can check it on your phone. <laughs> it's just not how my brain works. And that's funny because I used to be an avid, avid, avid couponer when my son was like two. That was how I kept myself busy. Um, all right. So this is one thing that I love to do, especially when I sold in grocery. Grocery um, stock on shelves is always very limited because they only have so much real estate for a particular product. So if you have something that's a great seller, but they only have six and you would like to buy 60, having a conversation with a manager and say, Hey, I would like to buy more of this. Can I order it by the case? You may not get a discount on it, but you may get the quantity that you want. Quantity is everything in grocery. A lot of us at grocery, uh, especially big name brands, grocery is very difficult to get in quantities that you want, um, meeting the vendor or the distributor minimums for grocery. I can attest to this. I've checked three different grocery vendors back in the day, and they wanted me to order 3,000 pounds of food a week or like five pallets or whatever it was. And I was like, nope, can't do that. So but quantity, they would let me order by the case at retail price. And if it was on sale, I still got the sale price. Yeah, exactly. And so it's having those conversations that brings us into our next point, which is building relationship with key people, whether that is the store manager, whether that is the stock people, because the stock people know a lot about when deals or when markdowns are happening or when new product is coming in. I loved talking to people at Target when they were stocking shelves because they tended to know when the next truck and what was going to be on the next truck. Um, they could look on their little scanner and tell you some interesting information. So that's always a positive is to build those relationships with people who are on the floor every day. Yeah, Amy had a, a, a relationship with someone at her local grocery store and I had one with um, the Walgreens manager right around the corner from my house. They were actually pulling stuff to put holiday stuff out and I came through and I said, 
what happened to your clearance end cap? It was like full last week. And they're like, oh, we had to put that away. We needed the shelf space for, you know, all the holiday stuff coming in. I'm like, but I wanted to buy like most of that. And the guy was like, um, come to the back room and buy whatever you want. And I'm like, sweet. <laughs> you know, so you never know what you said. They need the shelf space. As soon as the holiday is over, they need that shelf space to be able to bring the next holiday in. Whether it's, you know, right after Christmas, they put Valentine's Day on the shelf. So they need those, they just, it's Walgreens. They only have like six aisles. So go in there and say, hey, what are you doing with the rest of this clearance? Or ask them, when is this going on sale? I actually did this not too long ago for some I don't even remember what it was. I think it was like Halloween, not Halloween stuff. I'm thinking Halloween. Can you tell? Um, it was the last of like the summer stuff. And they're like, actually, we're clearing this out for back to school. And I was like, when is it going on sale again? And they said, 90% off tomorrow morning when we open. And I was like, great, I'll be back. <laughs> you know, because they have things that are 90% off is great, even if you're not reselling. So I can't help myself. I love discounts and deals and I'm not afraid to ask for them. So just build those relationships. Ask people, don't be afraid. Now, Kathleen asked, is grocery ungated now? I see that now I can sell in grocery items when I couldn't sell grocery before. Grocery is ungated from my understanding, but there are a lot of brands that are restricted within it. So know that, yes, you may be able to sell grocery, but pay attention to what brands you can and can't sell. And it may be as simple as going in and saying, I want to sell this, and it says brand restriction, you click on it and ask for approval, they give you automatic approval. Sometimes you have to go through more hoops than that, but sometimes it's that simple. So know that going into grocery. Um, oh, another thing. We've been talking about clearance a lot. You want to be careful with big box retailer clearance because it can go from being an amazing find to being a stinker in about 3.5 seconds. So for example, I... It was an Imaginex toy set. I found it. It was a, I don't know, 12 or 14,000 rank in toys. I was like, wow, great. This is awesome. There's maybe 20 sellers on it. This is great. I sent it in. And all of a sudden, there were 200 sellers on it. Because guess what? Target all across the country discounted that same piece at the same I time did. everywhere. Yeah, your region's going to be different. We've Amy and I have talked about this a lot of times, too. Like, I'll say, hey, have you found this? That You know, we used to do retail arbitrage all the time. We'd call each other and say, oh, look for this. Oh, look for this. Or did you see this? And she's like, they don't have that at my Walgreens. They don't have this. And she'd tell me a grocery product. And I'd say, they don't sell that here. So it's actually great news for you. The less amount of places it sells, the easier it is for, for you to be able to get a better deal on it that they don't, they don't have it regionally. So make sure you look for regional things in your stores as well. All right. Yes. Now, this is a very important part of this. When you are sourcing, one of the best things you can do to be a smart sourcer is to have a scanning plan. Have a plan. That is that four-letter word that we absolutely love to talk to you about because planning is what's going to happen to help you for success. We talk a lot about having a plan for Q4. We talk about that in the Q4 class. Shameless plug, mommyincome.com slash Q4. You have available to the end of the month to, log, to check that out to be able to help you plan your Q4. But here we're going to talk about planning and having a scan plan. So when you're walking into a store, think, well, I remember the first time I walked into Babies R Us and my eyes bugged out and I went, I don't even know how to deal with this store right now because I'm overwhelmed. I was overwhelmed as a new mom walking and I was also overwhelmed as a new sell reseller walking in. What you want to do is pick a category, pick something. Don't try and go, I'm going to scan the whole store. Actually, Kristen had a goal once a couple years ago to go and scan an entire Meyer, which is kind of like a Walmart for those of you who don't have Meyer. Mm -hmm. So I told her she was insane. Um, she did scan a lot of it. I'm not sure she ever accomplished the entire store, but you want to focus. When I got to hardware, when I realized that everything in the store, because that's how stubborn I am, everything in the score, store meant every package of screws, every pa and I got to the hardware section and I was like, Oh, I don't know about this, but at the very same time we were getting into wholesale and I realized that my retail arbitrage days were starting to go away mostly and that I was focusing on wholesale. So I guess I did give up on that big dream, but literally, literally they say that the slogan there is a million reasons, a single store. Like they literally have a million products. Um, and I was like determined that I was going to scan. I got through a lot of aisles. I had like this detail. I wish I could find that piece of paper, this detailed, like written out plan of like which days I was going to go and scan, which sections, which aisles. It was insane. We're not asking you to do that. However, picking a category, uh, stay away from hardware because it's tedious and crazy um, and very low margin, uh, but like having a category, specific products, and then doing one thing at a time. One thing at a time. Now, it's also important while you have a plan, 
when you start scanning stuff, you also need to have a plan on what is a good buy, putting air quotes there. You want to make sure that you have sourcing guidelines set up so that you know this is the product I will buy. If it's above this, if it's if, for example, Chris and I won't buy anything that's below 75% ROI, won't go near it, won't touch it, don't need to. We want 75%, 100, 100 plus is always the goal, but if it's 75 and we can still make enough, you might have a goal where you won't sell anything that you make less than $10 on. You might have something that has a percentage ROI, um, but we actually have a smart sourcing guide that we can um, that we have available that actually walks you through the step-by-step -step process that we do for our um, guidelines that we use in smart sourcing. Now this is for everyone, especially if you struggle with setting guidelines for yourself. Like Michelle was just commenting in the chat here of how she saw clearance toys at Target the other day for back to school stuff. And she's like, look away. I know it's a struggle, but it's really hard to not scan everything, especially when you feel like it's a good deal, but you have to set guidelines for yourself. So whether you're just starting out or whether you're a seasoned seller, having those guidelines, this is a great guide to be able to help you, um, set parameters. We go even through the reasons why and reasons why we think there's, we actually give you guideline suggestions and we tell you why we don't want to go under 75%. And we tell you why you want to look for, there's a lot of, it depends and your business model will vary according to everyone else. But having those guidelines, they're not, you know, stone wall boundaries, they're guidelines to where you know when you can step out and when you can't. And it talks about having a budget. So mommyincome.com slash smart is where you're going to get the smart sourcing guide. And it applies to all sorts of sourcing methods. It definitely talks more about retail arbitrage, but it's the same thing with wholesale. We still have guidelines when it comes to wholesale. Um, there's a lot of minimum requirements. And so we have to make sure we meet the minimums, but we also want to make sure that, you know, certain discounts get free freight and certain discounts get percentages off and you know you have to have those guidelines and you want to make sure that you're not buying product just to heat it meet a minimum and have it sit in your thing been there done that don't do yeah. that don't yeah. buy product just to meet a minimum buy product that you've actually spent time figuring out if it will sell or you have a bundle to put it in otherwise it will sit there collecting dust and wasting you money precious money that you could be spending on things that will actually earn you a profit. Now, this next section, I'm going to let Kristen run with because this is all her. This is, you need to make sure when you are sourcing that you know your numbers. So I'm so nerdy that even with retail arbitrage, I knew how much it cost me extra to even prep an item. So everything down to the fact that the poly bags were five cents, the label was one cent, this was that. I thought, okay, I pretty much have to add 15 cents to the cost of this item because that's how much it's going to cost. And I got my price per pound to the point where I knew that per pound, usually I got about 60 items in a box. And because I got 60 items in a box, it was 38 cents a box. And yes, I am that nerdy. However, because I figured that out as an approximation, I could add about 50 cents to the cost of goods to everything I was scanning, and I knew that would cover all of my costs. So I knew if this was scanning at $3 for cost of goods, it was gonna be $3.50. Could I still make my margins at $3.50? The answer was no, it went back on the shelf. So it's something that you have to factor in. People look through wholesale catalogs all the time and they don't think about the fact that if they don't meet the minimum for free freight, they're gonna be charged 10 to 12% for that to be shipped to their house. That's a big percentage. If you're spending $10 on something, that's an extra dollar for, for shipping for that particular unit. It's 10% it's of your order, not just, you know, you have to do the math. Yes, doing the math, spending time, and if you, if it helps, get a spreadsheet, do QuickBooks, whatever it needs to track that information. I know that both Chris and I in different times have tracked how much we pay per pound for our shipments, and we've gotten to a point now where we're looking at the options of um, palletizing stuff to save money on freight, because freight can get expensive, and if the small, the less shipments you send, the smaller, okay, not the less, the smaller the shipment, if you're sending one box, your per pound is going to be more expensive than if you're sending 10 boxes at a time. So factor that in and know that, and you can track over the course of time to see how much you're paying per pound. You can then use that average to know how much approximately you're going to be paying when you send products in. Now, I don't care how you track it. I don't care if you use pen and paper, spreadsheets, inventory lab, QuickBooks, 
um, stone tablets and you know jackhammers. It doesn't matter to me. But you need to track it and at least find it out or get yourself a close enough average. I know the accountants in the world are gonna be like, no, it's not close enough. It's four dollars and eighteen cents. That's my sister. I love her dearly. That's why she's an accountant and I'm not. However, I'll approximate it to be like it's about four dollars. Okay, the eighteen cents will add up if it's four dollars per unit times a hundred units. Um, but you know what I mean? Like round it close enough, like okay, it's about fifty cents per item to be able to cover shipping and, and you know packaging materials, whatever it is for you, and then just add it. But also remember the most key number that you need to think about. Each month that an item sits on the Amazon shelf, it doesn't sell, you get charged a, not a long-term storage fee, but just a monthly storage fee. Now, yes, it's very low, but if your item sits there for four months and it's a larger item, do you know how much you're being charged for that per cubic foot that it takes up? Because Amazon gives you those breakdowns. You say, this is costing me $2.20. This is a round number, so don't quote me on that. Your results will vary. But if you have an item that costs you $2.20 a month for shelf space at Amazon and you don't sell it for four months, that's two, four, six, eight. That's about $10, $9 um, over four months. With $9, is, is your profit more than $9? Otherwise, cut your losses and sell that thing before you start losing more money. Most people don't do this math and then they go, why did I lose money last year? I thought I was really making money and making all these sales and I realized I didn't make any profit. You don't get to the end of the year before you realize you're not making profit. You get to the end of the month, folks. So make sure you're ca calculating this stuff. I know it's tedious at first. It will become easier and then it will become second nature after a while and you'll start knowing that you'll start knowing the numbers because you practice them. Yeah, it's practice doesn't make you perfect. It makes you better and it makes you better able to catch things when they are a, I call them problem children, when they don't work the way you expect them to. Or I had one item that I sent in and was not oversized. It's 15 inches long and it somehow ended up in the oversized category. And I caught it because all of a sudden the fees that were getting charged on that made it so it wasn't profitable because that oversized fee takes a very large chunk out of your profit. And I was like, what's going on? Because I knew that I was able to follow up and say, um, this isn't actually oversized. Please have somebody in the warehouse measure it. They will. And they adjusted it so that it went back down and they actually, which is amazing to me, refunded the difference on anything that I had sold. So all those fees that they'd taken out, they gave me back which thank you, Amazon, not, not guaranteed they will do that. Your mileage may vary on that, but just pay attention. That wants to bring me to another point, which is pay attention. This is not a set it and forget it business. Pay attention. Do what not do just send mean? it in. It doesn't just run itself so that you can take six weeks off at a time eventually, but not for most people right now. Um, most of the time, Amy and I have gone on several vacations and walked away from work and we take weekends off now and we didn't used to, which we're getting better at. Um, but there is a time where you will get to the point where if you have a prep center and you have a VA and you have some things, they'll, they'll, you can definitely reduce, reduce your workload. We're working on doing that um, because that's the freedom and flexibility that we've always wanted with this type of job. And that's what we want to do. And so we're, we're looking at ways to reduce that. But you gotta start somewhere. Right now, we also have to talk about stocking up on supplies. They don't sell poly bags at Staples. So don't run out of them. Don't, when you have to go leave in the middle of a shipment, time is money, y'all, time is money. You don't wanna leave in the middle of a shipment to go to Home Depot or Lowe's or somewhere else to buy boxes because you ran out of them. Look for them ahead of time. Buy more than you need. U-Haul will deliver them to you if you order over $50. They're, I think, about the same price as Home Depot or Lowe's. They will deliver them to your house for free over a $50 order. Get it more than you need. If you don't have storage, um, ask for some garage space. Put them in a basement. Like, I don't know what to do with them. But we just stock up on supplies, especially ones you can't run out and get because you don't want to run out and get them anyways. And especially in Q4 when your lead times are longer and it takes longer for things in general to be shipped to you, make sure you have backups of backups, um, have poly bags, have labels, have tape, have all the things that you need so you do not run out because this is a time of year where you don't want to. Now, Kristen is used to, I don't know if she still does, but always did. She'd write when she replaced the toner in her printer, she'd replace when she last bought paper, all these things she'd write so she could see how long it took her to run out of what she last bought so she knew exactly how long and then she would put it on the calendar and say, I need to order it now because I'll approximately be out at that time. This is how she rolls. It's a sickness. I swear to you. <laughs> I'm laughing at myself. My kids 
literally are like, mom, you're a psycho. Like I time things perfectly. Like I thrive on that. I'm like, okay, how long does it take me to get from here to there? And I'm like, never really early. I'm like literally on time. I had to pick my daughter up from church camp the other day and we had to meet about two hours away. I did the math of like, okay, I'm probably going to drive about 73 miles an hour and I'm probably going to get there at this amount of time. And I literally rolled in at 12 o'clock on the dot and that was my goal i'm like i will be there right at 12 not faster not slower i'll be there at 12 and literally i pulled in that parking lot at 12 o'clock noon and i was like yeah i know it's really nice <laughs> you pat yourself on the back for that for years to come i know exactly how long it takes to get to my friend megan's from here i know exactly how long it takes to get to meg's from here to the store off halfway across town to my doctor's office it's 13 minutes it's 15 minutes it's like oh it's not about 20 minutes it's literally 18 minutes so there are certain things that Kristen will be Eh, about on and there are other things she'll be like oh yeah it'll take me exactly time versus money it's a difference in Kristen's world so just saying all right so as <laughs> as we've gone we're on our last one for the dues and the number one thing we want you to do while you're doing this is have fun because if it's not fun and it's just a job um it may not be the right fit for you you got to be able to have some fun doing this. Now, we're not saying that everything is all fun. Like, scraping stickers off of Ollie's stuff was never fun for me. But thinking about the fact that it was fun to shop for that and it's going to be fun to make 150 times my money on this, you know, little bottle of supplements that I just bought is super cool. And I like that part. And so I made fun. And so I jammed to some tunes while I was doing that. My mom and I would do it together. We would talk about different stuff. And you know, we would just look at things and be like, hey, this is, you know, this is part of the job. It's not our favorite part of the job, but we just love working together. Or I like this music or, you know, binge watch something in the background on Netflix or, you know, listen to the AC Files podcast, you know, while you're prepping or whatever, because we want you to be able to have fun while you're doing this. If you literally drud drud that's not even a word if you dread doing this over and over and it's just another way to try to make some money, you're going to hate it. Do yourself a favor and do something else. Because if you don't enjoy at least parts of this, then, then maybe it's time for you to check out another opportunity. All right. And remember, it doesn't make you money sitting on the floor of your living room. It makes you money sitting on the warehouse shelves at Amazon. So when it comes in, it needs to go out. It should not collect dust on your floor because it can't make you money there. Unless you're merchant fulfilling it, which don't make yourself crazy. <laughs> Send it to Amazon. If it can be sent to Amazon, please. It will make your life a lot easier. We want you to be able to have fun and getting a stack of a bazillion things to ship out in one day. It doesn't sound like fun to me. So we want you to have fun. We want you to do the things that we want you to do. And we don't want you to do the couple of things we're going to talk about next. Yeah, um, save this for last because we don't want to be like Debbie Downers all the time and talking about the fact that like this is all the stuff you don't do but there are definitely some things we want to warn you about and make sure you're not focusing on some of these, these things we touched on this a little bit earlier but we're going to say it again do not try to find loopholes this is how you get suspended this don't try to get around restrictions do not bundle with things that are restricted brands do things the right way list in proper categories, obey the rules and policies. Do not try and circumvent when uh, that's just going to end you up in trouble. Yeah, don't find loopholes, just follow the rules and you'll be so much prouder of yourself that you stayed the course, that you tried to get ungated, that you did the right things to do what you need to do and found different products different other ways. There's millions and millions of products to sell on Amazon. I know somebody who sells in the auto parts category and they only sell auto parts for one type of truck and that is all and they make millions. So talk about your niche, okay? They literally don't sell everything under the sun, they literally sell Dodge truck parts and that's all. Hey, whatever it takes. But did they try to get around the rules? No, they just prove what they need to do and they focus on one niche. Do you, but do it the right way, whatever that is. Um, my next one is please do not talk to other sellers about how to price your stuff. Do the research, look at Keepa, look at Camel, look at price history. Do not talk to other sellers about this stuff. It's, they it's don't know your business model. It's not even that. Amazon considers that price coercion and that actually can get you in trouble. You want to make sure that you're above bar and talking to other sellers about price is not above bar. Um, and it, so if you, if you contact a, another seller via uh, seller email contact and say, hey, I think you should raise your price. I was making more at $24.95 and you're down to $19.95. Uh, that's a big no-no. Don't go there.
and, and look at the price competitively, but realize you don't always have to be the lowest. Sometimes other people come in low ball, let them sell out and then sell for your $24.99. You know, look at the price history. If you feel like your price might be a little too high, that's the reason it's not selling, then bring it down. But this is not something you need to chat about with other sellers. It's just like you need to price for your profit margin. Look at the numbers, look at what's reasonable to sell and then sell to make money and don't contact other sellers about, you know, competitors. Don't whine about your competitors. Um, but this next one too is do not, like this is the number one. If you walk away from nothing from this hour of the show, do not compare your business to someone else's. Your chapter one is not comparable to my chapter 29. Okay, so do not compare, do not look at everybody else's fancy stuff on Facebook and all these different other YouTubers that are like, look, I made $4.5 million last month. Um, so they're not you, they don't have your circumstances, they don't have your budget, they don't have your family life, they don't have your kind of time, they don't have your kind of hustle either, honey. So just let me know, let me, you know, your chapter one is just as beautiful as somebody else's chapter 29, don't compare. Yeah, and set goals for your business and compare yourself to you. How much better did you do this month over last month? How many more products did you send in? How many more things did you sell? How many more things did you find to source? How more confident have you gotten in what you're doing in your business? Yeah, your goals are your goals for you. Like you can't compare that to what I've been doing. I've been doing this for almost 10 years. So yeah, we can clap for each other and we want to celebrate your wins with you, but don't get discouraged by that. Instead, look at it and say, okay, I want to up my game by 10%. I want to sell 10% more products or I want to up my average sales price by $3 by the end of you know Q4 or whatever it is. And make a goal for yourself and then take baby steps towards your goals and be proud of you. You are doing this. You are hustling. You are already doing stuff other people won't be doing this year. You started your own business. You are working it. So be proud of your success and your goals and stop looking at everybody else's stuff and go, woe is me. I'm not there yet. You're where you are. Celebrate that. And now let's keep on talking about the don't pay attention to what everybody else is doing. Um, we want you to stay away from this wonderful syndrome called shiny object syndrome. Been there, done that. I used to be a bolo chaser, a be on the lookout when people would post, hey, I can't find this anymore. It was a great seller for me. Guess what I did? I dropped whatever I was doing and drive around to every Walgreens in a 10 mile radius and try and find it. And guess how often I found it? Uh, probably 1% of the time. I, I tried to build an entire business model on Bolo's my first year. It was not a way to build an Amazon business. It might be a great place to find something fun if you're already outsourcing in the stores, but don't make it what you try and build your business on. So you are focused when you are sourcing, when you are prepping, you want to focus on what you're doing and not what everyone else over here is doing. You're actually going to find better product by not looking at what everyone else is doing and finding, doing your research and finding the things that you understand and know in the niche that you're comfortable with. We always got good. I got really, really good at selling toys and then really good at the health and beauty stuff that we were actually focusing on at the time because I stayed there. I said, I decided that I am going to get really, really good at knowing the toy aisles and knowing the brands and knowing the shows that were coming out and what kind of merchandise I was going to be on the lookout for. And I didn't go all over the place buying all of the things. I was not the you know, jack of all trades, master of none. I used to be that. And then I never, I, I struggled to try to find consistent product. So making sure that you just stay focused. I will give you permission to do like 90, 10 or 80, 20, if you must and say, okay, 80% of your inventory focus on a specific category, no matter if it's apparel or clothing or home goods or grocery or health and beauty or whatever it is, stay focused on that. And then you get permission to do 20% of something else. So you can have a little bit of that shiny object if you want to, but 80% of your focus needs to go on that. So if you're working 10 hours a week, eight hours goes to the bread and butter and two hours gets to go to the milk and honey. Okay. So that's how you got to like kind of divide that up. So you're allowed to stray a little bit, but staying focused makes you more money. I promise. Yeah. And honestly, it's that being able to be focused and getting better and better at, I remember when Kristen sold mainly toys doing retail arbitrage and you could walk down an aisle with her in target and she'd pick the brand new stuff off the shelf. Oh, I've never seen that. Oh, I never seen that. Guess why? Because she spent time learning the products, learning the product lines, learning the brands and being able to pick the new stuff off the shelf. So being able to have that kind of focus will do nothing to hurt you. It will only help you. Yeah, and finally, like, do not underestimate the condition of your item on Amazon. New is new, people, new. That means um, fresh out of the box, fresh off the shelf. If your Lego box has a crunched corner, it is not new. 
If you would not give it as a pristine brand new gift to somebody, it's not new. If it has been opened and taped closed, not new. It has to be factory sealed new. Um, so making sure you're paying attention to that, especially if you're doing books, undergrade, don't overgrade. If you think it's actually, you know, like new, maybe call it very good because your customers are always going to think differently. Um, so just kind of think about that. I would rather err on the side of caution when it comes to that versus overestimating and then have somebody really mad. Yeah, under promise and over deliver can go a long way with you with product on Amazon. Now, we've gone through the do's and the don'ts. We've got a bonus for you. Um, you don't want to do this alone. Reselling is a very isolating thing because a lot of times you're doing it by yourself. Kristen does it with her mom, which is awesome. I am a solo seller. Um, I used to do all of this on my own. It was through contacting with people in Facebook groups and in real life that I was actually awesome. able <laughs> yes, meeting this, this. Okay, I can't do that. <laughs> I help you. Come on now. We help it does together. help me. And it's that accountability and that help. But there was a long time there before I met her three and a half years ago that I wasn't able to have that outside source um, of support. And so having support is a big deal. We would love to invite you to be part of the Mommy Income community so you can have that support in your business as well. You head over to mommyincome.com slash join us with the code word top five. Answer a couple questions. We'll let you into the fold so you can get support in your business. Now we are not a, or a God, I want to say organization. That sounds really formal. We are not a community of hundreds of thousands or tens of thousands. We have a small community. We've kept it that way by hoops you have to jump through to get in so that the people in there really want to help grow your business and have support growing theirs. Yeah. So head over there, mommyincome.com slash join or join us. And you can, the, the code word this week is top five and we'll let you in and you can come and play with all of us and talk about your Amazon business. Ask your questions for the love of all things. Ask the questions. I mean, no question is dumb. We've all been beginners. We all had to start as a beginner. So there's no question that's too mundane. It's too beginnerish. Like newbies are newbies. We love to help you because we want you to see where we are. You are in a year. We want you to be like, yes, I'm rocking it. Um, also, we have a favor. Um, can you please do us a favor? Can you like our Facebook page? Just mommy at facebook.com slash mommy income. You can find the group the other way, but to find our Facebook page, we're going to start building our Facebook page with some more content for you guys. And we want you to like the page. Why? I don't know, because we want you to. Um, we also want you to subscribe to our YouTube channel and to share this with others and give us likes and give us comments. Um, you know, we like pats on the back every now and then. It's okay for us, for you guys to tell us that you like the show and you want us to keep coming back every week. Um, so please just do us a favor and do that. Leave a review on iTunes or in Google Play or wherever it is you listen to podcasts. And um, just let us know. If you want us, tag us in a post of some, some kind. We'd love to hear from you. And we really appreciate your feedback there. We want to be able to give you the best stuff every single week. And um, just leaving us feedback lets us know that you're still listening and you still really enjoy the Amazon files. And we want to bring you more really good stuff over the rest of the year. Excellent. And we will be back again next week, live, same time, same place. We'll be excited to see you then. So make sure you sign up at theazfiles.com. See you next week, everyone. Have a good one.